I'm Alex. Uh, I lead BrainJuicer for the US. Uh, most people uh, probably haven't heard of BrainJuicer, but we're a consumer research and innovation strategy firm. Uh, we really specialize in taking the latest developments in the behavioral sciences and applying them to um, research, to innovation, to strategic thinking. And I think, you know, hopefully what I have to share is going to be, as Aaron said, a bit of an outsider's perspective on, on, on marketing, really. You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what sort of marketing you're in. The objective of that marketing is to somehow influence, change, drive consumer behavior or human behavior, right? Doesn't matter what you're, what you're selling, be it a destination, be it a product, be it a brand. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is influence the choices that people make. And in some cases, when it's really, really, really difficult, actually change their behavior completely, okay? So, if I've done my job properly, towards the end of this 30-minute presentation. I've given you a grounding for how humans make decisions. And there's been a tremendous, absolutely phenomenal change in, in what we know about how people make decisions. And then also given you a new model for that and how that can be applied to marketing. Um, and we'll be citing some examples from, from the commercial world, from the corporate world, corporate advertisers, which will hopefully you know, kind of be inspiration, really, for, for you guys as you apply it to your own challenges. Uh, plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, don't heckle me throughout, but if anyone has a burning question, you know, hand up and, 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 um, and ask it, really. So let's get started. Um, Let's start with the current existing marketing model, the classical marketing model, right? Which is sort of left brain, right brain, emotion, rational, weights them both around about the same level of weighting, right? You can see from the visual, the best uh, analogy or description of the, the conventional marketing model, to, to me at least, that I've ever heard, is it's the hard fist of your your rational proposition wrapped in the velvet glove of emotion, right? The emotion sort of lures you in, pulls you in, and then once you're in, once you've got the attention of the, the human being whose behavior you're trying to influence, you've got to hit them over the head as quickly and as hard as you possibly can with a, with a rational, a sensible, a very compelling proposition. And if you do that, you're more likely to persuade them to do what you want to do be it to visit this place, stay at that place, think about your brand in, in this way, okay? Classical model of, of how marketing should work. It's been running for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. You know, if anyone here has ever worked at Procter & Gamble, they teach it incredibly well. The problem is, it's completely wrong. It doesn't work. It's not how human beings make decisions. And therefore, as a marketing strategy, it is completely ineffective. You can have some positive results, but it is very, very inefficient. Okay? So, how do human beings make decisions? Like, what do we know now that we didn't know in the past? Quick show of hands. Who recognizes this guy on the, on the screen, Daniel Kahneman, or has come across any of his work, uh, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow? got a few hands. He wrote a New York Times best-selling book. He's famous for two things, at least in my mind. The first is he's the first non-economist to win the Nobel Prize for economics. And the second is he looks really uncannily like my next-door neighbor. Um, he's, he's not actually my next-door neighbor, but the, the guy who lives next door, just, I mean, literally, they could be uh, doppelgangers. So Kahneman, in his book, he writes about system one, system two thinking. And if anybody you know, is interested in reading the book, I, I really do strongly recommend you read it. It's the sort of foundational text of modern day behavioral sciences. Now, system two is really the conventional way of thinking about how we think, okay? Which say that we're objective, we're very logical, we're very intelligent. Um, we really think through everything that we do. System one is the other part of the brain. It's impressionable, it's intuitive, it's emotional, and it's unconscious, right? 
So in some respects, left-hand side of the page, probably how a lot of you guys think you make decisions. System one, much, much quicker. It's subconscious. It's a lot more like Homer Simpson. And I'm here to tell you that I think everybody in this room is probably a lot more like Homer Simpson than they would like to believe is true. Okay? The rub, those two systems are not equal at all. System two processes information at about 50 bytes a second. It's the Commodore 64 of the brain. Okay? System one processes information at about 11 million bytes a second. So we've got 50 bytes, 11 million bytes. Huge difference. System one accounts for about 95% plus of all the decisions that we ever make. I'll give you a couple of examples. You know, just this morning, um, I got up in the hotel. I wanted to get coffee. I walked past two coffee shops on my way to Starbucks. I didn't go to Starbucks because the coffee at Starbucks is great. It's actually, you know, pretty crappy coffee if you talk to anybody who uh, is a, a coffee connoisseur. I went there because I can get the same drink that I would get at home in Chicago. I can get in New York, I can get in London, all over the world, it's the exact same drink. It allows me to use my system one, right? I don't have to think about that decision at all. And I'm absolutely thrown if I can't find a Starbucks, because then I have to walk into, a, you know, walk into another coffee shop and actually look at the menu, think about it, make a conscious decision about what to order. I can do it, I can use my system two if I really, really have to, but it's painful. It's very, very, very painful. So to get through life and all of the different decisions we have to make, we use our system one. You know, alarm clock went off today, I got up, I brushed my teeth. Hundreds of decisions here, right? Yet none of them are system two decisions. And I would, I would actually put to you that I'm not sure there's a lot of people in the audience who haven't made a system two decision all day today. That's how we get through life. So let me demonstrate. Um, a little bit of participation from you guys. So I want you to just shout out all at once the color of the letters you see on the screen. Red. Blue. Blue. Green. Blue. Okay, okay. So some of, some of you are quicker than others, obviously. But, but that's your system one and system two at work, right? You know, your system one wants to trust the very simple answer you know, trust the pattern that you've, you've just established. Your system two comes in as almost like an override, right? It, it, it sort of tries to catch it. For some of you, it did. You might be a little bit more system two than others. But for most of you, you just follow the pattern, OK? Another example. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? What's the answer to the question? Just shout it out. 10 cents. The answer is actually 5 cents. Now, you're going to challenge my math here to explain it to you, right? If you um, take the uh, $1.10, 5 cents, you double it to uh, 10 cents, add a dollar, you get to a uh, $1.10. I actually have a um, friend who's a qualitative market researcher who um, I've tried to explain this to him, and he, he just like, still can't get it, which I, I guess is why you should probably never trust a, a qualitative researcher with any. Uh, any numbers, but the, the point is your system one answer, right, 10 cents, that's the answer you give. It's only really when challenged, when, when pushed to think about it, that you start to give a system two response, okay? And it's painful. It's much easier to trust your system one. And like Kahneman says, you know, people are just not accustomed to thinking very hard at all. Um, you know, we're very, very content to just trust the plausible judgment that comes straight to mind. And this carries through into every aspect of our lives. You know, you would almost take, um, you know, in business, we're all, you know, business people here, take it very seriously, right? I can't tell you the number of times that I'm sat in my office and, some, you know, a team member of mine comes in and says, you know, we have this problem and, um, you know, here's how I propose solving it. And I have two, two sort of options, right? My first option is to gaze out the window, kind of rub my uh, face a little bit, and just say, you know, what you propose sounds very sensible. Um, you know, let's, let's go on and, and do that. Or I could take the system two route, right? 
which would be to actually try to really understand the problem and get down into the nitty-gritty and build the solution myself. Very rarely, even in a business context, do we take the system two route. We rely on our system one. System one is how we make decisions. Okay? Another analogy, um, and by the way, if, if people haven't read Kahneman's book, I, I, and you're a lazy reader, a little bit like I am, um, Kahneman's book can get us very hard going after about 100 pages or so. So Switch by Chip and Dan Heath is, is another great behavioral economics text that I would recommend for the more, but the less intellectual among us. Um, but their analogy is the rider and the elephant, right? Classical marketing strategy would try to catch the attention of the elephant, but then spend all of their time talking to the rider, because the rider's who's directing things, making the decisions. Wrong. To actually influence behavior, to change human behavior, to push people in a certain direction, you have to move the elephant. You have to talk to the elephant, and you also have to build a bit of a path for it. The easier you make it for the elephant to follow a particular path, the more likely they are to do what you want. So that's system one, system two thinking. Marketing today, if you want to actually change human behavior, is all about marketing to system one. Okay? So, great theory. Great that we know how people are making decisions. Um, so let's, let's think now a little bit about applying it. Um, so to do that, we need a construct. Um, we wouldn't be a a research agency or a planning agency if we didn't have some sort of complicated construct. Um, but this is Brain Juice's construct for applying system one thinking to marketing. We'd argue that there's really three pillars that uh, any marketing plan should try and follow. The first is environment, so this is the importance of context. The second is social, so this is the idea that we're not very good at making our own decisions. We're actually terrible at it. We're very good at copying the behavior of others. And the third pillar is personal. You know, the way I feel about any given thing. Personal emotion. Feel nothing, do nothing. Appeal to the heartstrings. So we'll take each pillar in turn, and what I'll try to do is give you a bit more explanation, as well as a few examples of how it can be applied. So, starting with environment, and, and the key text here is, is nudge. So, you have to build the environment as much as possible. Context is absolutely key. The way you frame things massively impacts the decision that people make. So I'll give you a demonstration. I want everybody to stand up. And I apologize, because I know Aaron did this in his intro. But again, everybody up. We're going to play a little bit of a game. Um, Mahatma Gandhi, um, you know, Indian politician, uh, he's obviously passed now. I'm guessing most people don't know the answer to this, but if you had to, you know, sort of make a guess, what age was Mahatma Gandhi when he actually passed? And I'll, I'll count the numbers, and when you get to the age that you think he was when he passed, I want you to sit down. So, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73. All right, it's, a, it's an instant average. I'm, it's a, it's um, a little bit of fuzzy math here, but I think, well, I'd say the average is somewhere between 72 and 73. I think most people are, are seated, okay? So I want everybody to stand again, if you don't mind. I'm sorry. Get, get a bit of exercise, you're going to be sat for three days. We're going to start again, and this time I'm going to start at the high end. Okay, so we'll start at 96, 95, 86, 85, 84, 83, 82, 81, 80. OK, 
Okay, we've got a few holdouts here, but the instant average is putting it around about 80, right? And you, you guys are sort of playing the consistency game, and you can all sit now, right? You're thinking, well, I said, you know, 72, 73 last time. I'm going to damn well stand here until he gets down to 73. And then you're like, well, wait a minute, though. A lot of people are sitting down, aren't they? So maybe I should as well. And I don't really know the answer. Um, the answer, by the way, is actually, I believe it's uh, 78. Um, so smack bang in the middle of the, the two data points. But you see the importance of context, right? Context frames everything. If you start low, work your way up. People plump for the middle. If you start high, you work your way down. You'll end up on the high end. So the extent to which you architect that context is absolutely key to the very irrational people, the human beings you're trying to influence. A commercial example of this, but probably the most extreme one I've ever seen, is Rolls-Royce, who uh, as we were talking to, um, not because I'm buying one. Business is good. It's just not quite, quite that good yet. Um, but they were telling us they actually sell more cars now at boat shows than they do in car showrooms. Makes very, very little sense until you think about it in the terms of if you're spending 10 million bucks on a yacht, 250,000 on a car, it almost seems like a bargain, really, doesn't it? I mean, in, in a way, you're actually saving money. You're making a sensible choice. Makes no sense, but it's the context. It's the way that you frame it. Another commercial example was uh, The Economist, and they used to offer two um, subscription choices for their content. Um, I think it was $49 for online only, and it was $125 for a year for the, um, for the print, you know, the hard copy to be mailed. And in that context, I think it was 80% of people plumped for the, uh, you know, the online only. It's a bargain, it's the cheapest. You, know, you start to argue that your rational self is coming in. Well, no, not really, because when The Economist added a third option, and that third option was $125 for the hard copy, the print copy, and the online content, all access, it actually went to 75% of people plumping for that option. Right? So now you have $49 for the online content, $125 for the hard copy only, and $125 to the hard copy and the online content, and you basically switch your entire model and upgrade everybody. Makes absolutely no sense, but the way that you have presented that third option is a bargain. And that's, you know, the, the, the context is really driving the way that the people make decisions. So you have to really think through what is your anchor point? You know, what are you anchoring whatever you're trying to market against? Another example of context being important is priming. Um, so pretty sure everyone here drinks wine, or most vast majority of people here drink wine. Um, so it's a really interesting experiment. French wine typically outsells German wine by about two to one. That's the, the sort of average in terms of sales. Is there, is there anyone from France in the room or Germany? Good, I, I can speak freely then. Um, <laughs> Series of different liquor stores experimenting with playing different music in the store. So for the first set of weeks, and they controlled this over various different um, seasonality breaks, they played French music in the store. And what happened? You hear the Parisian music. French wine outsold German wine by five to one. Typically, it outsells it by two to one. But by simply playing the music, by priming people to pick the French wine, it starts to outsell the competition by five to one. The next series of tests, they play German music in the store. So it's obviously militaristic and very uh, bombastic. And as a, as a Brit, I can kind of get away with making fun of the Germans. So what do you think happens? <laughs> German wine outsells French wine by two to one. Remember, French wine typically, with no um, messing, 
outsells German wine by two to one. So the magnitude isn't as great, but you've essentially flipped the magnitude with which people make a certain decision. Now, the problem is, with a system two approach, you're really trying to kind of persuade them. And if you were to just ask people, you know, has this music affected the choice that I've made, I would say, well, absolutely not. I'm far more intelligent than that. But the fact is that I'm not. Um, the more you can prime me to make a certain choice, I'm much, much more likely to follow through on that. And it extends right the way to all sorts of different tactics. Um, you know, presenting the outcome, like we did the, the Greenpeace versus presenting the problem. You know, framing things positively, framing on the outcome, actually cueing the reaction, the feeling that you want from people is far, far more effective than trying to persuade them that that's what it's going to be. So that's context. The next one is social. Um, so we're in America, right? Land of the free. We all make our own decisions. Don't tell me what decisions I can make. Wrong. We're not individuals. We make very, very few decisions um, for ourselves. We're actually just very, very good at copying other people. Um, the flip side of that, by the way, is that uh, you know, we're very unreliable witnesses to our own behavior. Um, so if you were to ask me, you know, how do I feed my kid, I would say, well, incredibly healthily. You know, if you were to ask my wife the same question, she would say that also. Yet uh, obesity rates continue to rise. Um, you, know, you can tell that by, by just looking at me. You get a much more accurate answer, actually, if you were to ask us, you know, what do all your neighbors feed their kids? Do they feed them healthily? we'd probably say, no, they don't. Um, much more accurate answers in terms of copying other people. So the best example of that, Crocs. There's absolutely no reason for anybody other than a medical professional to wear Crocs ever. <laughs> they're ugly, they're uncomfortable, they're not at all practical. Yet they took off, right? They fizzled a little now, but at one point there were Croc stores in uh, Soho, just around the corner from our, from our office doesn't make any sense, but you have to get out there and get people to copy you. You know, the, the ultimate example of this would be the iPod, right? The beauty of the iPod wasn't the device, the technology, it was actually the white earphones, right? What you've essentially done is make something that was an invisible product highly visible, um, and people just copied it, right? As I heard when David Bowie came to, to the US, many, many years ago, but I heard that he basically paid people to attend his uh, concerts and acted like a diva. And almost by acting famous and getting people to believe that he was famous and copy him, he, uh, he made it. So that's, that's key. Social, people copy. The more you can get out there and cue that sort of behavior, the more effective you're going to be. Final pillar is emotion. Um, so feel, do, then we think, we post-rationalize. So we're rational creatures, right? Um, some very, very big decisions in our lives. You can see three of them on the screen. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm in the process of buying a new, new house. And I can't tell you the number of houses that I've been to. And I've walked in, and I'd be like, I'm just not feeling it. Um, yeah, it meets all of the criteria of the realtor. You know, We've given the realtor, and the realtor is obviously a little upset how picky we're being and dismissive, but just not feeling it. You just have to feel it. And the objective of any type of communication is to get people to feel something. You know, if you feel something, you're going to act on it. If you don't feel something, you're not going to act on it. Great example is five-star, what we call it brings you a five-star creative. If you can tap into the heartstrings, the ROI of your communications is going to be vastly superior to the traditional model of how advertising works, which is, again, to grab my attention, then once you've got it, kind of bombard me and hit me over the head with these rational messages. You know, one, one company that did this incredibly well was Free Mobile in the UK. Um, I'm not sure how familiar folks are with Free Mobile, but essentially they were the number five player network in, in the UK. They had two big problems. Number one, nobody knew who they were. And number two, their product absolutely sucked. Their network was terrible. And they did reassure us, by the way, that they also had a plan to fix their technical problems when they told us that they wanted us to help them 
get them known. So the brief that they gave to their creative agency and to us was literally this. Make us famous. Um, make us famous for our love of the internet in a way that makes more people like our brand. That's a system one brief at work. And that's the way that you know, we would recommend you, you brief any of your creative agency partners. And this was the result. So that was a five-star piece of creative. Um, it was probably one of the most effective pieces of creative in the UK of last year. Um, and literally within a day of that ad breaking, um, the press had gone wild. And within two weeks, they'd gotten 80 plus pieces of unearned, you know, completely free press coverage. The Daily Mail, which is a, a tabloid in the UK, um, actually sent reporters up to the Shetland Islands, which is off the coast of you know, very northern Scotland, um, to interview people and talk to them about Shetland ponies. And it was a, a double spread. So you know, just tons and tons of coverage. Most importantly, um, you'll also notice there was a, a hashtag at the end of the uh, spot. And that linked, essentially, to their online presence, which was PonyMixer.com. You could go to the website and actually build your own commercial. Um, Dancing Pony, select your own soundtrack. Very, very cool. They had over 800,000 visits to that site. Um, if the UK is a population, I don't know, give or take about 80 million people, you know, that's a huge proportion of the population visiting your corporate site. And in terms of impressions and Twitter, you know, they had celebrity tweets from around the world. But also the pony, the actual pony, got 1.7 million followers. Again, we're, we're really rational, sensible creatures, right? <laughs> so amazingly successful campaign. It actually moved them from number five to number four in the market in terms of consideration. Um, and it just flipped all of their equities, both on their core drivers as well as the category's core drivers transformed the brand, and they did actually fix their network as well. Um, and as I said, by abandoning the idea that communications is about persuading me of anything, taking the message out, and actually tugging at my heartstrings, making me laugh, incredibly effective. Another example um, is from the US. Um, Guinness, you know, everybody knows what Guinness is. It's really a feeling that other than St. Patrick's Day, when there seem to be more Irish people in Chicago than in Ireland, um, it's, it's sort of a drink for, for somebody else, right, in, in, in the US market. And they really wanted to change that. Um, so they worked um, with BBDO and alongside us at an early stage to actually test a series of ideas. And this was one of the most successful five-star adverts from the US of last year. Um, do you want to play the video? Friendship. 
the choices we make reveal the true nature of our character. Again, it went viral. The big proofing point was that sales of Guinness spiked in September and October of last year, um, almost to their St. Patrick's Day levels. Um, actually exceeded them in places. Tugging at the heartstrings really made Guinness a drink for someone like me. Now, if you were to ask me very rationally, did you like the ad? Sure, I liked it. Did it, did it make you want to go and buy more Guinness? I'd say, well, no. Um, I'm far more intelligent than that. Why would a, a, a group of guys wheeling around in their wheelchairs actually influence my behavior? And while I might be reluctant to admit it, you know, the business results prove out that by doing that, by moving people, making them feel something, taking the explicit messaging out of advertising, you're more likely to be more effective. So uh, just to wrap up, three key takeaways. Elephant and the rider, right? The new marketing model is all about talking to the elephant. Please read switch, read thinking fast, thinking slow. It's all about talking to the elephant, not talking to the rider. How do we do that? We frame the environment very, very carefully. The environment is so important. The context is really king. And cue the behaviors that you want, because people copy other people. Most importantly, I think, from a communication standpoint at least, you know, famous and effective communication, it's all about seduction. It's about great creative that seduces and doesn't interrupt that, hitting me over the head and persuading me with why your product, your brand, your destination is so much better than anywhere else. If you leave me feeling positive, then that's enough. It's going to implicitly draw me much closer to the brand, even if I, even if I don't know it. Thank you very much, Alex. A round of applause for Alex.